Western Australia. When most people head north out of Perth, they head up the coast via Geraldton, Carnarvon, etc., or they go up through the Great Northern Highway. But there is another way north not too many people know about. Normally when I go away, I take the caravan. But on this trip, this is going to be my accommodation. This is going to be interesting. So if you're looking for a holiday that's a little bit different away from the crowds, this might be right up your alley. So while I run the intro, go down and hit that subscribe button and the bell next to it and that'll let you know when I've uploaded another video. leaving Mount Augustus today and we're going to be heading to uh, back to the Great Northern Highway and uh, we're going to be coming in at the top end of the mining pathway. Um, the timeline is going to run a little bit backwards now because it came out from uh, from Geraldton, the, the mining, and we're going to be sort of heading back towards that way. Um, our first town we're getting to is uh, Megathara which is as far up as the railway line went. As we leave Mount Augustus, I've got to say, I'm a little bit disappointed. There are still many things to see around here that we didn't have time to do. So before this trip is over, we will have made plans to return to finish off what we missed. Well, we've left Mount Augustus now, it's out behind us. Um, I did say yesterday when we were climbing the hill, to uh, consider your limitations because you do have to be able to get back down again but I discovered this morning there is another one you've got to consider is you need to be able to move in the morning when you're packing your camp up I found it a real struggle this morning anyway we're heading out towards Mekathara now and um, Mekathara is uh, where the rower line terminated when it came out from Geraldton uh, it wasn't just important for the mining industry it was also important for the pastoralists because out to my left out here is the canning stock route. Now in its early day the canning stock route was used to bring the stock down from the Kimberleys and uh, they brought them down the Mekathara here, put them on a train and then trained them on into uh, Geraldton uh, where they would be uh, sold off or exported and sold off. We came across the old restored Mount Gould police station, so we stopped to have a look. Mount Gould police station opened in the 1880s as a centre for police protection for the Murchison pastoralists. In the late 1890s and early 1900s, sheep were very expensive 
so any of them going missing was a real concern. Police were there to deal with the problem of Aborigines that were stealing sheep. But to the Aborigines, the problem were the whitefellas, who took the land and fenced off the waterholes, so to them, the sheep was a fair price to pay. At Mekathara we joined up with the blacktop again and it's a much needed fuel stop before continuing south. As I said, Mekathara is the top of the mining pathway. But just to remind you of the mining story, let's have a quick look back at part of episode 1. Gold strikes were found in sandstone in 1895, Mekathara in 1896 and Payne's Fine in 1911. The region was thriving with people and activity. Although the mining of the past died off and the people have moved away again, today multi-million dollar mines are still operating throughout this area. If only the men of yesteryear knew what they were walking past. Our next stop is going to be Kew. In its heyday it supported around 10,000 people, but today it's around 200. Kew started out pretty much the same as every other town in the area. Gold. This story starts with a prospector who was tinkering around the area, having a look, bossicking around, trying to find something. Came across an Aboriginal fellow, he had a uh, hunk of gold around his neck, and the prospector said to him, where did you find that? So the Aboriginal fellow showed him. And that spot was right here, what's now in the middle of town. And that prospector's name was Tom Q, where the town got its name from. It wasn't long before 1,500 people were all camped along the uh, creek line that is now the main street of Q. With the population soaring, they dug a well deep into the creek bed to provide water to the town. Not long after that, the town was struck by typhoid fever from effluent upstream. This continued till a better water source was found. You think this comes from the original well which was polluted? I uh, might give that a miss. The rotunda marks the place where the well was dug. In 1904 they built a bandstand which was dedicated to the pioneers of the Murchison. On Saturday nights it was a popular meeting place and the local band used to play here as well. We stepped into one of the shops where they had products on the shelf just like they did a hundred years ago. The lady of the shop was only too keen to tell us about how the shop operated back then. The cashier would sit up the back and the money would shoot around the room on these cableways. The post office has always been the post office. The clock was given to the post office by Lord John Forrest, the first Premier of Western Australia. It had to be wound every day by climbing a ladder and pulling on a counterweight, a job that no employee ever wanted to do. The old Shire office was built for the London and West Australian Investment Company offices. It had 18 offices and two shops. 
In 1901, the upper floor was set up as the Murchison Club with the help of a soon-to-be American president. Then uh, respected men of the area would then come here and discuss matters of the district. The minutes for the local road board mentions many times the problem of roaming stock in town. One of the radical ideas to solve the problem was to write to the Perth Zoo and ask if they would pay the freight if they were to ship them the cattle to the zoo and they could use them to feed the lions. In 1887, when the railway line arrived, it really opened the area up to transport of wool, people and gold. 1,500 people arrived here to see John Forrest and a number of other parliamentarians open the railway line up. Although the railway line is long gone, the old station is now the grandstand for the local oval. For the next couple of nights we're going to be staying at the Kew Caravan Park. This park is run by the local council and it's very popular. The park is right next to the tourist information bay and only a few minutes walk to get into town. It's a half decent sized park with room for all sizes of vans including some pull through spots. The toilet block is clean and modern, and get this, no tiny little cubicles to have a shower in. Nope, you have room to swing a cat, and then flush it down the loo after. I'm kidding, you can't flush the cat down the loo. Pipes are too small. All jokes aside, this is a great facility, and there are plenty available, so almost no queuing. They have washing and drying machines, a barbecue, and also a communal fire pit. The old historic mining huts are also available, but you have to use the park shower and toilets. The facilities range from a single room with a double bed, to a double bed with a bunk for a couple of kids, and maybe a bit of a kitchen. Check the Kew Caravan Park website for more info. Well, Q really was a bit of a surprise. There's heaps of stuff still around here from the early days, and you could spend a day or two just checking out the area. And that's what we're going to be doing. So if you want to see what else is around here, then tune in next week for the last episode in this series, where we'll check out some of the old ghost town sites and have a look at some Aboriginal paintings, and something that shouldn't really be there. So if you like what you saw then hit the thumbs up and click the subscribe button so you don't miss the next episode. These trips are completely self funded so if you'd like to contribute to the production of these videos there's a link to my Patreon page in the description. As they say you can buy me a cup of coffee to help me fund the channel. So till next time happy travels.